All right, let's get started. Just waiting for some technical uh, issues to get cleaned up. So, uh, so what I said we would do today on Friday is uh, that I would go over the assignment due today, and then I would open it up to you for questions, either about your group project due Friday or for the test, which is on Wednesday. All right, so. Uh, let's go ahead and, and do that. Uh, before I put on the, the computer the model, I think it might be helpful to see how we can turn problem 36, problem 636, into a transportation problem. All right? So what we have here um, is we have production, or that could be seen as, as supply, and we have a um, certain amount of, of demand that, uh, or that we need to be able to um, meet. So what we have here um, is we have two different nodes that will represent our first month production. This would be the, the regular and this would be the overtime right here because the costs for each are, are different so we have to have different arcs for each one of them. And the same thing is true for month two. We have our regular and our overtime and then month three. All right, let me put this down for those of you who that gets in the way. All right, and then we have how much uh, demand we have for each of those months. And so we can produce like this for each month where either our, our regular production or our overtime production um, generates the, the supply that, that we need. Okay. But we can also store in uh, a warehouse or a facility from month to month. So there is also this kind of a connection here. All right. And then we put costs on each of the, these lines. So how much does it cost to produce uh, month one regular? It costs us $50 per unit, right? How about for overtime? 80. How about month two? 50. And overtime? And month three? And overtime is 100. What are the costs here? 20. Right, it costs us twenty dollars to store it. Right, maybe we have a storage unit or something like that. You have to cool it or, or whatever the case may be. <coughs> and then finally, we need our supply. So, how much can we do in our month one regular? Two seventy-five. And overtime. And month two, 200. And, and month three. Okay, and what are our demands for each of these months? How much do we want in month one? 150, 250, and 300. Now, you should be able to just look at this and be able to see that we're not going to be able to satisfy month three from just what we have here, right? We're going to have to generate some stuff in earlier months. There, we're going to have to pay at least this cost, if not both of these costs right here, right? Does that make sense? So that's how we would turn this problem where we don't see a network description anywhere into it into what kind of problem would we call this? 
close. Why is it not a transportation problem? It's these two nodes right here that have stuff coming to them and going through them. So it's a transshipment problem. That's the distinction between a transportation and a transshipment problem is everything goes to its destination in one flow rather than going through nodes on its way to its final destination. All right. So let's go ahead and, and build this. So. Uh, well, it might help if I type in the right keyboard. All right, so our costs. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the, the same kind of generic setup that we've, we've started using, where we say um, these are all the sources. So it could be month one regular month one overtime, month two regular, month two overtime, and month three regular, month three overtime. That represents these as being sources. And I'm going to add these because these can also be sources. So that would be month one surplus and month two surplus. I'm not going to put month three in here because it, we're not going to send anything from this month three note. But if this were a longer example, that would be how we would include it. Okay, and then the destinations are, are pretty um, easy. Our, our month one use, month two use and our month three use, like that. Okay, and now we can just um, go ahead and put these values into these costs right here. So we know that month one regular is, is 50 to month one, and then what should the connection be between here and here. Right, we're going to put that super high cost that it will just never use. And this, how about for month three? The same thing, right? How about month one overtime? How much does that go to month one? That's 80, right? And it also doesn't have connections to month two or month three. And then we do, we keep doing that, right? Month two doesn't have a connection to, to month one, so this needs to be high cost here, but then we put in our regular cost for month two use at 50 and at 80, just like for month one. All right? And then month three <coughs> doesn't connect to month one or month two, but it does connect to, to month three, right? That is um, at 60 and 100. Okay? And now we get the surplus, right? That represents sending through here, right? So that's going to be high, right? We don't keep it to ourselves. We ship it. And we can't go backwards in time. So those are our costs right there. Now we can go ahead and actually choose how much to produce. <coughs> All right. So And this is just, if we put a value in here, that means we're going to produce that much in month one overtime to 
to be used by month one or to be stored for future months. So we have supply and we know that that supply is 275 or 100. 250 and 150 right there. Let's leave the supply off for the month one surplus right now, right? Because that's, that's different. Um, how much is, is produced here? Well, that's, that's pretty easy. That's actually this sum. You could just say it's that one because we, we know details about it. But I'm keeping this generic here. All right, and we have our demand. All right, how much does month one want? 150. How much does month two want? 250. How much does month three want? 300. Okay. So up till now, we've been just basically summing this column, right? Uh, in this case, that not quite right because uh, that would only be adding these inputs in, right? We also have to take this out, so it shouldn't be uh, a straight sum, right? It should be it should be everything that we ship out um, or ship into month one minus everything that we pass on to the following months. All right? Does that make sense to everyone? All right? This this column represents everything that we send to be used by month one. And we have to subtract the surplus that we keep around. Okay? And the total that we make minus the stuff that we save, that has to be um, at least equal to our demand. Right? The same is true for month two. Everything that we produce for that month minus everything that we pass on. And month three is really easy because we only ship stuff into it. We never take any stuff out. OK? So we've got our costs. We have the movement across these arcs. We have our supply constraints. We have our demand constraints. All right? What needs to be true about these values right here? We haven't put those in right there. How much can we send on to, to this part right here? What's the limit? What limits how much we can send on here? So yeah, we, we can't send more than we, we can't automatically generate supply out of nothing, right? So this right here is everything that came in to month one. Everything that came into month one is what it's, 
supply is. And the same is true for month two. This is everything that comes in to month two. Okay, so let's go ahead uh, and turn Open Solver on. And go ahead and enter this model. So our objective self, what's our objective? We haven't even talked about that. What do we want to do? <coughs> Minimize costs. We don't have that in here, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we compute our cost? Some product. Of what? Of the top thing. Yeah. <laughs> of each of these costs right here mm -hmm. with how much we actually send. Mm -hmm. All right. And this is obvious. Should we minimize or maximize our costs? Minimize. minimize. All right, and what are our variables? What do we want uh, as an answer to our problem? This table right here, right? We want to know how much to produce in any given month. And our constraints. Okay, let's start with our supply constraints. What do we want to be true about what's produced right here? Yeah, we want it less than or equal to our supply so that we can't. And that. Okay, what about? Our demand constraints. What should be true about this demand right here? Sure, our demand should be less than or equal to our available. But since we'll put our our right hand side as a our constant, I'll change that to greater than or equal to. Right, you want to make that clear, I know it didn't sound clear. We want how much we make available in any given month to be at least as much as we need. So the, this row right here needs to be greater than or equal to how much we're asking for. All right. And then finally, we have these two constraints down here, which have to do with these, these surplus, right? So the amount that we save needs to be less than or equal to the amount that was made in that given month, right? All right. I want to change this right here. What happened to those equations? Oh, there we go. Month we want to whoa. We want to include month one surplus in what we have available for us, right? So this is just like the last ones. All right. All right. So we see that 
um, we do produce everything that we can in month three. Right? We produce 150, but we knew that wasn't enough. And again, we produce everything we can in month two, that's 250, but that's just enough to meet month two's needs. So we're going to have to produce extra in month one. And of course, we produce as much as we can in the regular time and only what's extra in that, in that overtime right there. So uh, we produced 300, which is 150 extra. We pass it on to month two. It produces 250, which it uses, and passes the extra from month one on to month three. So it takes 150 it produces, plus the extra 150 from month one to get us the 300 that we needed. Right there. Okay. So this looks a lot like all the other transportation, transshipment, uh, net workflow, shortest cost algorithms if you can generate this graph. It's all a matter of can you figure out what the graph looks like in order to turn it into this transportation-like problem. Okay. Once you get this, I would expect this to go pretty straightforward for you because you've seen a lot of these graphs. The, the trick so to speak, is getting this graph, I think, in this problem. Yeah, Jason. Will that be at the heart of the test then, converting the concepts to the graphs? Or that, that would be an example that you might see. Okay, I won't come up with a new problem type that you haven't seen before, though. So I won't come up with some, um, some problem that you don't know, you shouldn't know how to be able to convert that to, to that graph. Um, but you might see an, uh, another one of any of the types of problems that you've seen here in Chapter 6. You should be prepared for a straight transportation problem or a transshipment problem. You should be prepared for a shortest path problem or a maximum flow problem. You should be prepared for a redistribution problem or uh, an assignment problem is what this is called. We're assigning how much to do for this given um, production schedule. All right. So for chapter six, those are all um, possible problems that you should expect to encounter. Now, I don't think in one hour's time I can give you one of all of them. Uh, uh, <laughs> If, if you're really glutton for punishment, well, you, I can have you stay later and, and work on it. <laughs> and, um, and so um, it will be a sample rather than a, a, a full smorgasbord, so to speak. All right. Yes. What's another example of some things that are going to be on the test? So, so in these examples here, um, as I've... Uh, said in past classes, you won't have your computer with you. So you won't be actually running the model. So you might have to generate a graph like that. That would be a legitimate thing to do. Or I might give you a graph and you have to give me what the, all the constraints are. Give me all the equations for the supply constraints, the demand constraints. If there's something like this, the no net uh, aggregation constraints, you need to be able to show what the, the mathematical equations are for, for all of them. Or I might have run that model already through Open Solver, and you need to be able to interpret the, the results. So for instance, uh, if, if we think of a maximum flow problem, I might say, where would you suggest to add additional capacity into this network? In order, um, and now you have to look at, well, what are the binding constraints? Where can we no, send no more additional capacity through, through these links, right? And so you have to interpret your, your sensitivity analysis to be able to answer those kinds of, of questions. Um, so all phases of the problem solving uh, process are, are parts of, of the questions that, that you might experience. Um, and you just need to be prepared uh, to either 
create the models or interpret the output from the, the computer solutions to those models. And the same is true if you go back a chapter to chapter five. Um, so in chapter five, you'll remember that the types of problems that were done there were your portfolio management. So you had um, different years of investments and you either had that conservative investor who um, didn't want to lose any money or some uh, uh, lower threshold for, I'm willing to um, not make as much money in any given year if that can help me make even more money in, in other years. Right, so again, how do you construct that model? And um, how do you, um, how do you interpret the output of that sensitivity analysis? Um, and, the, and the same is, is true of, of all those problems in, in uh, Chapter 5. So there was the revenue management, which is the, uh, or perishable inventory, which was the hotel rooms or the air airplane reservations. Uh, and there was also the, the game theory, where you had to uh, be able to produce um, a, a representation of that game in a table. Uh, you definitely should be able to do that. And any game that uh, you would have to do for, <laughs> for the test, you should be able to identify first, uh, can, is there a pure solution for that game? Uh, and if it is, you should be able to say what that solution is. Um, and if there's not, you should be able to identify why it's not. Um, and be able to produce a model that could tell you what the different statistical um, allocation to the different game strategies should be. So half the time you pick this strategy, a quarter of the time you pick this second strategy, and a quarter of the time you pick this third strategy, as an, an example. So you need to be able to build that, that model, or I might, again, run that model through the computer, produce that sensitivity analysis, produce the, and, and you can say, this is what the output was, and remember, with the game theory, from the sensitivity analysis, you can get the behavior of both players. Because the, um, the shadow price for the constraints for one player become the probabilities for the other player. So even though you won't run those, those models, you'll be able to get the probabilities for both players from, from that, um, that one output. Okay. So you just need to be familiar with all these different problem types, be familiar with how to construct them and how to interpret their, their results. And th there's a lot of different problem types to, to kind of be comfortable and familiar with. Right. More questions? Questions about your group project as well? Yes? So did all the things that you said to make sure that the model would stay linear, uh -huh. uh, but it still said that it was non-linear. So <laughs> I like I had all the variables binary uh -huh. um, and summing to one, uh -huh. and sum to one. Uh -huh. Uh, you, you need to make sure that you don't use like if statements mm -hmm. or maximums. Mm -hmm. uh, How do you get the um, objective? The, the objective is um, that you want to minimize that, um, the difference between the, the different values. Right, so that was that variable that it, it just, it, 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 the analogy is just like your portfolio uh, assessment where you set some minimum value and you tried to make all the different allocations be larger than that. In this case, you're trying to set some 
maximum difference and you're trying to make all the differences be smaller than it. Okay. Yes? Could you go over setting up that like, matrix again that okay. helps you get to your objective? All right. I feel the lights are dark. Can someone turn on the second set of lights? Okay, so what we said is um, So this is data that you should already have collected, that you have different counties available to you and you know how much all their populations are. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to assign one of these counties to some congressional district. And so we're going to say, um, I'll do CD for short, Congressional District 1, Congressional District 2, Congressional District 3, and so forth. And what we said we were going to put in these columns right here was a binary assignment. So if we want County A to be in Congressional District 2, we're going to put zeros in all the other values and we'll put a 1 in that Congressional District 2. And if, if this is Congressional District 1, it should look like this. And let's keep this Congressional District 1, and this be 3, and this is going to be 2 as well. Like that. Now we, we said that all of these values are variables because this is what your program is trying to decide, is what the assignment is for any given county to um, a particular congressional district. That's the answer that you're trying to come up with for, for this Friday. We said that the first constraint for these is that they all needed to be, I don't want to put that there. Binary, right? That the only legal values were zeros and ones that it shouldn't come up with a 7 or a 3 or negative 2 or whatever, that only zeros and 1s make sense in, in here. The next thing that we said is if we just left it like this, this could be problematic because the computer could easily say, well, that's a legal binary value in that row, right? And county E is in co uh, Congressional District 2, and Congressional District 3. And for our assignment, we're not going to break counties up like that. So that's not legal for our assignment. So we, so we said that uh, you're going to have to make another column right here, which is just the sum of all of these rows right here. And what do we want to be true about that sum? So that's our next set of constraints, that each of those have to be equal to 1. And we do want equal, not less than or equal, because if we let less than or equal, then we could leave a county unassigned. Right? So now we've got each county assigned to some congressional district right here. That gives us an answer, but we haven't talked about what our objective is. Our objective is that we want each of these congressional districts to roughly be the same size. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to try to make the difference between the largest congressional district and the smallest con congressional district as small as possible. If we make that difference small, that means that there can't be much variation between any of the given congressional districts. Okay? so. We um, made another set of columns right here, which represented the population of Congressional District 1. 
the population of Congressional District 2, population of Congressional District 3, and so on. And what we said is these are going to be directly computed by combining these values right here with these values right here. How did we say we were going to combine those two together? What is in this particular entry right here? We want to know, is County A in Congressional District 1? Is it? No. no. So whatever we put in here, we, we want it to compute the value of 0, right? No, it's, it's not some product. Say it louder. The district times the population. Yeah, we're going to multiply this entry right here by the population. Right? Just that, those two entries. This is going to, so I'm going to call this um, A3. So this is A3 times A2, because that's the population right there. What goes in here? We're going to do A4 times A2, right? Because I'm going to multiply this value right here times that population. And this is going to be A5 times A2, because I'm multiplying this value right here times the population. We know that only one of these can have a 1. And since they're binary, all the others have to be zeros. So the values in here, one of them is going to equal this population value because one times anything is that anything. All the rest have to be zero because we love binary multiplication. Zero times anything is zero. Right? And so these equations right here will result in either the population showing up from that county because we've done this assignment or a zero because we haven't done that assignment. So we will copy this same kind of behavior except in this row it's going to be B3 times B2, B4 times B2, B5 times B2. And we'll get this giant grid of all the population possibilities for each county corresponding to each congressional district. Couldn't you just do the sum product of like congressional district one and then the population? That or would you should just have like one cell for each population. That that is what this will end up doing down here, right? Uh, because you want to sum all those together. Yeah. Right. But we're using uh -huh. Do we need the other grid? Um, Can you do a sum? No. Yeah you, I, yeah, you could. You could just, you're right. You could sum product this times, yeah, right. times that to get so, to, yeah, yeah, you're right. Do we need the other grid for something? Or? You're, no, you're right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that'll work. That's a lot. Cheaper. Okay. Yeah. It's not going to speed up your thing a whole lot because you haven't reduced any variables, but it's a lot less, it's a lot more compact and more easy yeah, to right. read, right? <laughs> All right. Yeah, so that's nice. You, you, you're right. Some product of this times that will give you the exact same thing. All right. So now, because I've already written here, let's pretend like we did it this way, but some product is a lot better. Um, we've got our populations of each congressional district. Okay, and what we said we were going to do is we wanted to make a um, grid here that represents the differences between each of those congressional district populations. So um, uh, CD1 pop, CD2 pop, CD3 pop, CD1 pop. And now, what we would do is, uh, in here, we would do the Congressional 2 District's population minus Congressional District 1's population, and that's what would be in this cell right here. 
and you do that for every pair of values. Now, if you do it right, what should you expect along this diagonal? Zero, because you're doing district minus itself, right? Do you do it for the whole? Like yeah, so we want, we want all pairs, because we don't, we don't know which one's going to be big, bigger. <coughs> so one of these is going to be a positive value, okay. and one of them's going to be the negative opposite. Okay. Right? And we don't know ahead of time which congestional district's going to be larger and which one's going to be smaller. <laughs> So n now we've got all the pairwise differences between these populations here. Okay. So now we're going to make one more variable here, which is our um, maxima maximum difference. Right. And what you want to do is you want to make a constraint such that this maximum difference is greater than or equal to any value that's in this grid right here. Right. So this truly represents the biggest difference between uh, all of our, and, and what we want to do with that is we want to minimize it. Right? Yeah, Daniel. So when you do that in open solver, you can just say that the that value is greater than equal to the whole that whole rows and columns, that whole table. Uh, yes, because that re it represents not just one constraint, but okay. one constraint for each grid point. Okay. But it should be less than. Is yeah, is it less than equal to? No, it needs to be. No, you're writing the. You're saying maximum you're difference is greater than or equal to all of these values. Right, you just have it backwards. Just oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm saying it's, I'm writing it, yeah, 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 okay, yes. <laughs> you would choose a greater than or equal constraint, right? I'll say greater than or equal to, there we go. Maximum difference is larger than all of the values in here. And then our objective is to minimize this. Square, right? So this is also a, a variable. Do we have to put an equation in that cell? No. This is exactly like your portfolio assignment, right? Where you said, um, what's the m minimum gain that we can get from this assignment of all these variables to these different years? And you, you just left it as that value, and you said try to raise it up. It's the same as the game theory, where you, you try to minimize your, you, you tried to maximize your gains, or minimize your loss, depending upon which side of the, that game you were, you were talking about. So there's not an equation in here. It's a value that the computer solver is going to try to put in here. And the thing that just keeps it from just going a giant negative number are all the constraints in here, right? This is bound to be larger than all these values. So it can't just put in here negative a million because some of these values are, are not going to be less than negative a million, right? There's going to be some difference that keeps this from going too low. Okay, yes? It could, yes. Yes. Um, one of the bummers, one of the bummers about binary um, variables is uh, that it, it uses a different solver than, we, than the simplex solver that we've talked about so far. Um, uh, those of you who are computer scientists will know that this is an NP complex problem. Uh, uh, and uh, for those of you who aren't, what I just said is that this is super hard. Uh, uh, it's uh, in in a in a mathematical sense. Okay. So literally, if you wanted to come up with a maximum, uh, the the best optimized solution, they'd have to try all possible combinations of these binary values. So. Um, 
That's a lot, yes. Yes, that's why. Is that okay? Yes. So what you can so what you can do is in your settings you can change um, how much time it spends looking and and before it says I've tried enough possible solutions. Okay. Um, so um, so if if you're not happy with that allocation, uh, or especially when we start going on more refined ones, uh, you might say, that doesn't look reasonable at all. You can tighten up its parameters and say, well, you have to keep looking until at least you do this much work. OK? All right, if there's no more questions, then I will see you guys on Wednesday.